You keep going one more. All right, thank you. Um, at CSPR, we're, we're an organization who believes in sound fiscal and economic research that ultimately is used as information to inform the critical policy debates across our state. Uh, today's topic is concerning the state of education uh, during the current uh, economic and health crisis we all face. Um, this is something that I'm sure has touched many of you on the call today and are juggling your own work. Uh, at the same time, you're having to give more support to your child or children who are learning remotely. Uh, and interestingly, we actually had a, um, uh, someone who we've uh, interacted with quite a bit at CSPR who was interested in, in joining this webinar, let us know they weren't able to join, but they sent us a note saying, um, sorry, we won't be able to attend. My wife and I uh, are homeschooling our grandchildren so that their parents can work from home. Um, how the times have changed. And they actually wanted to throw out the first question, which might be on the mind of everyone is, uh, should we be planning to, on doing this in the fall as well? So uh, with that tough question that I think many parents are, are uh, very interested in knowing, I want to turn this over to our guest speakers today. Uh, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Brenda Bausch-Dickoner and Luke Ragland. Um, Luke, who you, who you hear from later, is the president uh, of Ready Colorado, an education policy organization based in Denver. Uh, Ready Colorado supports education champions and advocates for a more student and family-centered uh, education system. Uh, he has had the honor of writing uh, policy briefs for former President George Bush and other cabinet level officials. Uh, and I think most importantly is, um, is he's a, a fourth generation Colorado and grew up in Dolores, uh, Colorado and now lives in Denver with his wife and daughter. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Brenda Bauschikoner, is CSPR's education fellow. Uh, after earning her PhD in public policy from the University of Colorado, Denver, uh, she spent the last decade working in education policy at the national and state level, most recently at the Colorado Department of Education. Uh, highlights of Brenda's work include helping Colorado's commissioner and the State Board of Education determine actions to take to improve the state's lowest performing schools and districts. Uh, we collaborated with Brenda on a deep dive into the history of Colorado's funding of K-12 uh, last fall in a report uh, titled Dollars in Data, a look at K-12 funding in Colorado. Highly encourage you to take a look at that piece as I think it's still relevant. Um, but uh, today she is going to be talking about the current crisis in learning termed uh, the COVID slide. So let me turn it over now to Dr. Dick Honor. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, good morning, everybody. We are here to talk about the COVID slide, and this is a phrase that refers to the learning loss that's expected to occur from the mass closures we've seen uh, in terms in school buildings. So over 124,000 buildings have closed both in the public and private school sector, leaving about 55 million of the country's 57 million students to learn from home uh, to some degree or another. And so this COVID slide is what we would expect to be the, uh, the content that students are just not going to have absorbed or might even forget when they come back to school in the fall. And you know, when we say that some students are attempting to learn from home, it, it does look very different across the country and within school districts and even you know, school to school in terms of how students are doing that. Um, there was one uh, study that looked at a, a, a large number of school districts and found that really that about half were actually even offering any type of, of online learning. And then the other half that are offering it, it's a, it's a pretty wide range of how they're doing it. So parents are shouldering a lot of the burden for homeschooling um, or grandparents, as Chris mentioned. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of that and what that means in terms of the COVID slide. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. 
Great, thank you. So the project, one of the organizations that's try to model what this learning loss might look like is the Northwest Evaluation Association. They do, they provide assessments for local school districts. So they have a wealth of data that they were able to build upon to use uh, or, or to model from to project the learning loss. So they found that 70% of learning gains might be lost or they, sorry, students might only retain 70% of their learning gains in reading, whereas they might even, they might lose anywhere from a whole year to half a year's learning gains in math. Uh, so there could be students who are really behind in math, and then we would expect students to be somewhat behind in reading. And other research has indicated that our youngest students might have the biggest challenges. They're losing that, that critical momentum in foundational math literacy skills, as well as the, the social, behavioral, and classroom management, um, how to follow the teacher and all of that. So our kindergartners are going to really struggle next year. And I think teachers and school leaders need to think about for their elementary school kids, how they're going to kind of structure classrooms to get those students back on track um, as they move forward. And if you go to the next slide, please. And this short-term education loss, we're expecting kids to come back behind next year. This could continue to build you know, year after year. Students will fall further and further behind unless there's some type of targeted intervention. And we know from research that you know, some kids might never catch up and that this could have long-term implications in terms of their, uh, their career prospects as adults. So there was a study conducted in Argentina on extended teacher strikes and found that Elementary students who missed two to three months of school had lower wages as adults. And these learning losses we're talking about now could continue to be exacerbated next year, as we know that next year's instruction will likely be interrupted into the question that Chris posed earlier. You know, I, I, school districts are planning for some type of hybrid learning model, and I would say that's very likely for next year to have a blend of in-person and online learning. And so this, this really makes this issue even more important to discuss today, thinking about how we can make sure that these learning losses aren't continue to, they, they don't continue to build and build, but rather we address them and then think about how we're gonna structure next year's learning as well to uh, address some of those gaps. And if you go to the next slide, and you know, this next slide that's going to come up is about how these gaps are going to really, how these learning losses are going to be different for different segments of students. You know, we know that those students who have other hardships in their families that, you know, their families may be experiencing unemployment or food insecurity or do not have access to technological, technological devices or internet, those students are going to have a harder time. And parents who are, don't have the ability to shoulder that homeschooling, uh, those students might fall further behind. So our most vulnerable students who are already at risk are the most likely to continue to fall behind. And these achievement gaps that have been present in our system for a very long time are likely to be exacerbated. Uh, you know, we know that remote learning is not the same as in-person instruction. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, some kids are not even accessing it. And Ready Colorado uh, conducted a survey in April that found that over 35% of parents in Colorado said their children are not, have not participated in remote learning since the shutdown. So those are some Colorado specific numbers and we know this is happening across the country um, as well. And I think that it's, you know, it, there was one researcher who, um, she's from the Center on Reinventing Public Education and she testified to Congress last week and phrased it as, you know, if we don't think about flattening the learning loss curve, students might go into academic death spirals. So this is really serious to think about how we can really target those students who have, who potentially are already behind academically, might be further behind and are continue, going to continue to struggle academically unless we seriously think about and plan for how we are going to meet the needs of these students. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Luke Ragland with Ready Colorado to talk about sort of the, the fiscal struggles that are gonna be present with this, uh, with next year, and then also some strategies that could potentially mitigate this COVID slide. Cool, thanks Brenda. Um, 
So if you just hit the next slide there, um, uh, JD, you know, I want to talk. So Brent, I think, has highlighted the key reality here, which is um, kids are in trouble in terms of their educational future. It's not just uh, something that can be put, a, ba a band aid can be put over and fixed and, and we'll move on and forget about this ever happening. Uh, as she mentioned, there's a lot of research showing that these sorts of shock impacts on kids' learning can have lifetime impacts and, and economic impacts uh, for, for decades and decades to come. But I want to give a sense of the environment that we're in here uh, in related to the state budget. So we've got a, a lot of acute need in students, but we are also simultaneously facing an economic collapse. Um, uh, newest numbers from the Joint Budget Committee just yesterday. Uh, they updated their revenue forecasts and uh, sort of expect, expectations for uh, revenue generation over the next year. So the economic contraction began in March of this fiscal year and over the last, just the last three fiscal, uh, the last three months of the fiscal year from March to the end of the fiscal year, uh, they're expecting that there's almost a $900 million general fund deficit at the end of this fiscal year, just from those three months of contraction. That, uh, next, that means next year we start with that $900 million hole um, and, and add to it another $2.45 million or billion dollars. Uh, all in all, um, the rollover from the last three fiscal or last three months of this fiscal year to next year is we're looking at a $3.3 billion projected shortfall um, or decrease in, in revenue. That's 25% of the general fund, which is the amount of money that the legislature gets to choose where to allocate each year. So, uh, you know, an absolute uh, gigantic hole has been blown into the state budget. Um, schools are well over a third of that general fund spending. Um, so general education accounts for about 36% um, of all spending. What that means is that it's impossible that schools are going to be spared from cuts, right? Uh, it's, it's simply not possible that schools will be able to survive this, um, this budget uh, problem without any cuts. Uh, I would also highlight there's another ticking time bomb that came out yesterday, uh, projections around local share. So revenues that are raised locally, but are part of the overall per pupil revenue for, for students in Colorado are expected to, hit a, uh, to have a massive decline because of the Gallagher Amendment and decreases in oil and gas revenue. Um, that will uh, be a ticking time bomb that won't hit for another couple of years, but that's projected to be another $400 million hole that's blasted directly at K-12 education funding. I think the bottom line here is that this is a, a huge problem financially, um, and it's not going to end soon. We are going to see the impacts of this uh, for the next several years, and in fact, the uh, nadir of the, of the economic collapse in terms of education funding is not going to be for at least probably two years. So things are unprecedented, they look bleak. I'm, I'm giving you a very negative picture here this morning, but I think it's also the reality, especially sitting through the Joint Budget Committee yesterday. Um, but as Brenda mentioned, the educational impacts are not going to be spread evenly. I think that for me personally, my belief is that in this moment, it's a time to triage and make sure that resources, educational resources are used to support the most needy students because kids are not gonna be impacted in the same way um, by the COVID slide. Um, I think, for me, that also is that on the highest level, we cuts in 2008. Um, we used a sledgehammer approach where we used across the board cuts that were evenly applied. I don't think that makes sense. I think that considering the unique circumstances of this, problem, that we should use a scalpel and be much more creative and, and much uh, more thoughtful in the way that we make cuts this time around. So if you could hit the next slide for me. I want to talk about a few solutions that Brenda and I have discussed. Um, we had an op-ed in the Gazette. I hope you all had a chance to read that. We, we talked about some of these, but I wanted to uh, spur the conversation here um, as well. And Brenda, I'd encourage you to chime in uh, as you see fit on these. Um, you know, at the very highest level, I think that we need creative solutions to expand instructional time, and we need flexible models that are responsive to individual student needs. Um, and that allow students to remediate and accelerate at different paces, considering they're going to be at different places when they return to school this fall. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, education as usual, the alternative, doing just what we've always doing, done and expecting that to work is going to leave many, many students behind. And I don't think that's an acceptable answer at this point in time. Um, so you know, what are some specific solutions? I think first, a baseline to understand how far students are behind would be important. Um, 
I think schools should be smart and, and, and rigorous in uh, administering diagnostic testing this fall. Um, no one likes tests. Nobody likes taking tests. I understand that. Um, the state tests were canceled this year, actually. Um, there was no state test given, so we've lost an incredible amount of data that's used in school choice decisions um, and for to hold schools and, and districts accountable. Um, but I think schools need to know where their kids are at and it needs to be done on an individual basis. That might not necessarily look like a statewide testing regime, but I think schools must sort of understand where kids are at and so they can start to remediate and individualize the response. Um, again, noting the, the theme here is that we believe that students are gonna be impacted dramatically differently by different circumstances. Um, the second one, this maybe seems obvious, but I think is a critical component that the state needs to consider is finding creative ways to expand learning time and instructional time. I know this is tough, particularly in a budget crunch. Um, it has to happen. And I think that collective bargaining agreements pose a major barrier here. And that's something that I would encourage people to keep a close eye on as we uh, move into the next educational year. Hit the next slide for me, if you would. More ideas. Um, you know, I think that uh, that uh, schools need obviously to be equipped to provide personalized learning and small group instruction. I think that might mean considering staffing changes and thinking about reorganizing classrooms in different ways. Those are obviously local decisions. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity for public and private partnerships where we can support academic enrichment that occurs through after school programs, through community programs, summer programs, internships, and the like. I think um, breaking down those sort of normal walls might be a critical tool that we can use and harness uh, in, in order to provide supplemental and additional learning and experiences for children. Um, I think one really specific model that um, it could, could be considered and I think uh, would solve a couple of problems is using a tutoring core model um, where you use college students who maybe uh, lost their jobs or not in college to provide on-demand tutoring uh, for students who are behind. And I think that that's uh, something that the state should strongly consider investing in. Um, uh, and then, you know, similar to the CARES Act stimulus checks that you saw going out to families, I think that the state should strongly consider providing educational stipends directly to families in need to give them the maximum flexibility to use that for academic support that their child needs. Uh, fortunately, there is actually a, a federal grant that is open right now that the state of Colorado has the opportunity to apply for to do just that, to create these sort of micro grants for families. And I think that that provides a, um, a really truly unique way to um, provide resources to families in ways that they can use it to uh, identify the needs uh, that are most acute in their individual child. Hit the next slide for me. You know, finally, I, I think we want to talk a little bit here about competency-based education. And for those of you who aren't sort of in the edu speak world, uh, competency-based education is, is a concept where students move and progress through their uh, learning experience uh, as they master subjects as opposed to uh, when, when the amount of time passes by. So the traditional model, of course, is time bound, meaning, you know, kids move on to the next grade or to the next level uh, when a year passes. Well, that doesn't always account for different needs of different students. A competency-based model says that students progress along their learning pathway when they're ready, when they've mastered a subject. And if you think about that, that's really helpful. Uh, that sort of frame is something that's really helpful potentially for kids at both ends of the spectrum. Kids who are ready to move on, who are accelerating quickly, uh, aren't held back by you know, having to wait till third grade's over before they can do fourth grade work. Um, and then on the other side of it, students who need more help in a particular area, maybe they're great at reading, but mid trouble in math. Uh, instead of just moving them along, uh, especially in uh, something like mathematics, which is often sequential in, in terms of how folks learn it, uh, they actually will master that before they uh, move on. So kids aren't left behind on a single subject where they might be struggling. Um, there are competency-based models, you know, both in Colorado and around the country that are uh, sort of nascent or just uh, starting to begin. But I think it's something that the state should consider investing in and looking at uh, promoting uh, both at the local level and the state level. Uh, the state of Colorado particularly might need to consider some statutory changes around rules to seat time and other things that are really stuck in this old model of, of thinking about education purely in terms of time. I wanna uh, encourage Brenda to jump in here on, on any of these sort of high level things, any meat you'd like to provide uh, on some of these strategies to mitigate the COVID slide. Yes, thanks Luke and a great overview of some potential ways we can address this, this massive challenge facing us. 
Uh, one thing I found interesting, as I just saw the other day, was around that the tutoring model, which was a very, as you said, specific idea, but one that lots of folks are talking about just because it's around that piece of how do we increase instructional time for kids and, and maybe lift the burden from our, our school systems to do that. And if former Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam just announced that his foundation is going to be supporting a, a Tennessee tutoring corps and they are providing $1,000 stipends to college students, current college students to provide tutoring this summer. College students have to go through a background check, have at least a 3.0 GPA, and then will be linked with students to provide, um, elementary age students specifically, to provide targeted tutoring and help and hopefully mitigate some of this this learning loss. So again, there are lots of folks in other states mobilizing around these ideas. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting specific one. Um, and, and you know, the other thing I would just say is around um, these strategies. You know, one thing to consider as as schools are planning for this and planning for next year and having disrupted instruction is thinking about how we continue to hold expectations high for schools and for students and to know that you know, we need to target, as, as Luke said, target our resources and our attention to those students who are falling the most behind, um, certainly. And we also need to think about at the same time, how do we continue to, to measure progress and hold students accountable, hold schools accountable? Because um, we also know from other research that you know, students, uh, when the bar is held high, students will rise and meet that bar. And I think what we don't want is to let you know, our, our foot off the pedal in terms of that progress that Colorado specifically has made in terms of school accountability and hold high standards for all kids. And I think, you know, the first couple of months we spent focused on the well, like health and wellness aspects, making sure students were okay. And that is absolutely what needed to happen. But I think as we move forward for next year, there's ample time for us to prepare and ensure that both the, the mental health needs of students are met, but also the academic needs and that we are continuing to hold all kids to high standards. So I just wanted to throw that additional thought out that wasn't in our slides. Yeah, you know, one other thing I would just point out, uh, stepping back and thinking about all these different strategies that we've discussed today, is that these are things that I think um, will be relevant after the COVID crisis is over, right? Um, the idea that students need different things and that we should make our education system more personalized and individualized is something that I think will ring true uh, even after COVID is gone. And so all these strategies that we've discussed today, I think are important things, changes that we can make now to deal with a crisis, but I would actually probably put our education system on a, on a better path forward. And I always like to tell a little story about this to help make this real for people who are listening in is, you know, no two kids need the same thing. And I always ask parents uh, about their individual children. If you have more than one kid, you know that those two children, even though they live in the same house, they have the same parents, they, uh, you know, maybe eat most of the same foods, their bedtime might be even the, uh, similar. Those two kids with every demographic factor controlled will need different things for their education system. And when you apply that simple lesson to uh, 900,000 kids across the state of Colorado living in Montezuma County uh, and Denver, and think of just the massive differences of need that they have, we have to have an education system that responds to that. And so uh, something that's choice-based, something that's individualized based, I think is really the future of education in ways that we can tailor uh, learning for in each individual unique circumstance. I think COVID just highlights the need for that uh, more than ever before. Brenda, I don't know if you want to close us out here, uh, provide a little summary. I'd love to, I see already the one question that Chris put in the box, I'd love to answer that, but maybe you can, uh, if you can hit the next slide, uh, whoever's controlling those, and then uh, Brenda, maybe you can summarize that for us. Yeah, yeah, JD, if you can go to the summary slide. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Luke, that this is not, um, you know, this hasn't created inequities. It, it might be exacerbating current inequities, but it, it's more shedding a light on the inequities that were already in place in our system. And I would say the inflexibilities as well. So we are just seeing this at the forefront. You know, this is being called to our attention because of the crisis, but we know, we've known for a very long time that we need to try to close achievement gaps and to also meet individual needs of students better. So I think this is creating that urgency for us to adapt as this, um, the current slide says is to adapt what we're doing and to really target target our attention to those students that will have high academic needs when they come back. And, and now is also the time for us to really all come together to think about this, that parents should be at the table, community leaders should be at the table, that this needs to be a local decision so that we can community by community 
target those needs that we need to address and to think about how we're being the most strategic with our resources and to really get our, our get our students back on track and to ensure that those who are on track stay on track you know as Luke said the with the kind of more competency based model you can also have those kids that are um, accelerating hopefully they can continue to do that and not be lose ground because we have to you know change how we're doing things so really thinking about how we can address the needs of every kid no matter where they are and uh, I, I think maybe we can turn to questions now and see what's on the minds of, uh, of our listeners. Yeah, I saw one question. I'll, I'll just start uh, there in the chat. And it uh, was brought up right at the beginning, which is whether schools are going to be open next year. And, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci, who, you know, seems to be uh, the leading scientific voice on this uh, issue, put a big warning out yesterday that schools may or may not be open next year? Um, that's a major question. It's similar to what Governor Polis has put out in some of his guidance and commentary here in Colorado. Um, on a call with superintendents a couple weeks ago, he told them to be prepared that they might not be back in, in school uh, until next January. Um, so it's a huge question mark. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Brenda or I have the, uh, the clear answer to that. Um, the only thing I would point out in addition to that is that even if schools are open uh, in, a, in some sense uh, this fall, I think there's going to be many children who um, aren't there because of various reasons at home. So uh, let's say they live with their grandparents and they, have, they are a high-risk population. I think that there's a certain segment of children who are going to be kept out of school even if the schools are open um, just because of uh, parental choices, um, which obviously is fine. But I think that that begs the question about how we're going to serve those children how we're going to count those children, how we're going to fund those children, uh, are all gigantic questions that, that um, but frankly, our current system is not well equipped to, to answer. Um, Brent, I don't know if you have any thoughts about predictions. I mean, you can, maybe you do know, yeah. feel free to shine a light on this about whether schools are going to be open next fall. Well, I think, unfortunately, we do know at this point that at a minimum, it's going to be a hybrid of in-person and online learning. And I think there's going to be some different approaches to making that happen. You know, I've heard about staggered start times, um, alternate days. So students go to school in person, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then Tuesday, Thursday, the next week. I think those are two of the more popular ideas I'm hearing. So I think that's something we'll get more details on over the next couple months. Um, but unfortunately, I do think there will be a, a remote learning to some degree. I'm just hopeful there's some in-person instruction as well, and that it's not all in remote learning. I mean, I did see that, you know, this is impacting higher ed too, of course, and I did see that the Colorado State University, or sorry, not, see it, not Colorado State, sorry, California State University system, a very large system of colleges, um, they announced that they will be all fully remote learning for next fall, at least. So Colorado, I've not heard from Colorado colleges, but anyways, so they'll just give you a sense of sort of the, the news that will be trickling in over the next couple months will be, I think, announcing those types of plans. Um, I, I had a, another question posed to me um, in the chat, and it's uh, from a school board member about what can we do? You know, they feel like that it's important that schools are open in the fall. I tend to agree. I think that not only do we need to figure out a way to make this safe for children to, to reenter and learn for their sake, but I also think the economy relies on a school system where kids are there during part of the day um, and ha many sort of dual working households uh, require that sort of assistance in, in terms of a, an in-person school setting. Um, so what can you do? I think the key thing is uh, getting really clear about protocols uh, and ways that we can make open, reopening schools safe. Um, because it's not just a, a, a barrier in the sense of the government is shutting it down. I think there's a psychological barrier uh, that many people don't feel safe re-entering society. And you're seeing a lot of polling showing that. And so I think obviously testing becomes a critical component of that. More information uh, based on testing to isolate and, um, and trace various people who uh, have COVID, but then really clear protocols that make sure people know that schools will be uh, safe to reenter. And I, I, Brenda, I don't know if you have any thoughts about what we can do uh, to, op to try to make sure that schools are open in the fall, if you have any advice. Yeah, I, I just agree with that sort of analysis that however we can be creative and, and thinking about putting clear protocols in place to at least try for in-person instruction, it's going to be just super critical to get kids at least some amount of face-to-face -face instruction. You know, it could be 
um, very small groups of students and those again that are falling academically behind come in for a small group instruction where a teacher just has a small number of students and can keep them spaced apart. I mean, there's lots of ideas that are coming out in terms of how we can think about this. Um, and then, and then on the flip side, I do think we just need to also get better at remote learning. Like there's lots of people, lots of places that are doing it well that we can learn from. And I think getting that piece nailed down is really important because unfortunately there is going to be some level of remote learning. So how do we do it better? And I think a lot of, there's some really interesting models being done by charter networks um, and private schools as well. And, and public schools are, you know, some public schools are doing a good job of it, but a, a lot aren't. And so I think how can we sort of model those best practices? Um, we had another interesting question in the chat here from my good friend, Miles Mendoza. Uh, Miles asks, are there predictions of how many private school students may migrate back to public schools and the impact on social distancing and the cost to the state? Uh, this is a, a very, very important question because uh, with the way schools are funded is on a per pupil basis. Um, and so obviously if a large number of students leave um, the private school setting for one reason or another, I think there's financial reasons that students might be leaving private schools, but also private schools have been absolutely devastated by COVID. Um, in terms of a financial perspective. So if kids are moving from the private system in Colorado back to the public system, what sort of costs and impacts would that have on the state? A group called Ed Choice actually tried to put numbers on this. And if 10% uh, of, the, of the students in, in private schools went back to public schools, it would cost the state an additional $21 million annually. If 30%, um, which actually I think is a little bit more realistic, um, it would be $65 million roughly dollars uh, annual cost of the state and growing. Um, those are those are real real costs um, uh, that the state would have to bear if those private schools are shut down. And I think that it's a it's a sort of hidden risk here that underscores the fact that people are going to be changing uh, regardless of what happens with schools being open. And, you know, Brenda mentioned a survey of parents that we did earlier this year, where we found that 35% of kids are not accessing any sort of remote learning currently. Um, but the, uh, the other interesting piece of data that we saw there is we asked parents whether they're considering doing something different in their state or in, with school next year. And uh, about 17% of parents said that they are probably going to do something different with school than they had previously planned. And if 17% of kids move from one sector of the, of the system to another, it, it could cause massive financial shocks in one way or the other. And so it's another sort of key area and sort of second order effect that I hope we, we keep an eye out. So what does that mean from my perspective? It means that we need to provide support and from my belief to private schools um, in Colorado. There are, you know, everybody has this idea that private schools are just Kent Denver, but there's a lot of private schools um, who are serving middle and low income families in Colorado and making sure that those are places that are uh, able to continue to operate and to serve those families to me seems like a, an important move. I have a, Brenda, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? I have a, a question. Uh, as, I, okay, as I was listening to your, to your remarks, and, and I think this is, adds on to one of the questions that just came in, but in your opinion, uh, I know you talked about the state budget and the potential ramifications there that will play out in the budgeting process, but in your opinion, at, at what level of school administration uh, is, is are most of these critical decisions in terms of mitigating the learning loss and addressing uh, educational reforms to change how students are um, engaged through the fall and, and, and through this, what level of administration is most critical? Is this uh, at the school level, uh, district level? Is this up to uh, a state uh, organization? Does this fall on teachers? Um, in your opinion, where is, where is the most critical? And I'm, I'm, I assume all will have to in some way adapt, but uh, where is your focus in terms of these particular reforms? To Brenda and to Luke, if you both want to address it. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, education is very local. So I think if this, I would expect the state to set some kind of high level parameters and requirements. Um, and then it'll be up to districts to kind of customize how they meet that. And I think at the district level, what's gonna be important is for our district administrators to communicate to their teachers how, what their expectations are. So we're seeing a wide 
disparity right now, district by district, in terms of what they're expecting, in terms of teachers checking in on students, whether attendance is being taken, whether grades are being given, um, what kind of support, what special education services are being provided, and to what extent. And so I think those decisions need to be um, well thought out at the district level. And I would expect the state to kind of provide more of a, a basic framework of what needs to be in place. But Luke would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think setting clear expectations uh, about what we expect from our massive state investment, even, even yeah. when our state investment is gonna be cut, we are gonna have uh, still continue to spend a, a great deal of, of our state resources on education. So I think it's fair for the state to set clear expectations about what we hope to uh, get on the return on that investment. But that being said, I think that it's really, really critical that we leave the how, how we, how schools meet those expectations and how they choose to uh, develop and change things uh, to the local school districts. And then the thing I would say is I would go actually one level deeper than all of that and say that nobody knows better about how um, to remedy some of the problems related to the COVID slide better than families. And thinking about ways where we can actually bypass all of those folks and get resor educational resources directly to families that can be used in creative ways that are supplementary uh, to what's happening at schools. Because schools are going to be trying their best. I, I would never sort of, I don't think there's any school out there that is not trying their best, but they simply might not be able to adapt um, and individualize in a way enough to serve individual needs and, and gaps that have resulted here. So I think that thinking creatively about ways to get families direct resources um, is, is something we have to consider if we care about supplementation that's necessary to remedy the slide that's happened. Um, two, two questions here, I just see if you would like to address. Uh, one is, in, I guess in relation to the discussion today in terms of the learning loss and mitigation strategies, have you heard anything from the Colorado Education Association about uh, their framework in addressing this? Has there been any, uh, anything released there? Yeah, um, you know, uh, they don't typically invite me to their roundtable legislative strategy meetings, but I think there has been some public communication from CEA. For those who don't know, the Colorado Education Association is a, a, a union that represents school employees, including many teachers, um, but all, represents many other sort of classified staff as well. Um, they, uh, they've basically been out there saying there should be no cuts to education. Uh, I don't think that that's a, a realistic place to be. Um, you know, the Speaker of the House, uh, who's a Democrat and is no, you know, sort of conservative has made it clear that education must be a part of the overall budget balancing picture. We have a balanced budget requirement here in Colorado. The idea that schools are going to be completely spared from this is, um, is, is ridiculous. And I would point out that char certain buckets of charter school funding have already received significant cuts. So the idea that schools have not already been impacted is, is wrong. Um, you know, thinking about CEA and some of the sort of more progressive groups, advocacy groups at the Capitol, you're seeing a new push for an emergency Tabor tax. Uh, Tabor actually allows the legislature upon two thirds vote um, after spending down all its Tabor reserves to uh, enact a, a tax without the uh, approval of the voters. And I know there is a push by many progressive groups of which CEA typically aligns um, to do an emergency tax. Um, and so that's something to keep a close eye on as legislators come back on the 26th for the legislative session. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll let this be the, the final question uh, unless you guys have some closing words, but, uh, and I, Again, don't mean to put words in the, the questioner's mouth here, but um, are there, you talked about some of these mitigation strategies, uh, are there regulatory barriers at some level, federal, state, that might prevent or make it more challenging to see these adaptations um, that uh, that you have laid out in this framework? Are there, are at either in the public school, uh, traditional public school, charter school, or private school level that might get, that again, make it more challenging to have these adaptations? I would just chime in, absolutely. I think that there's restrictions at, uh, you know, basically every level that will make it more difficult and that I think we should take a hard look at, at eliminating. Um, starting at the local school district level, 
um, you know, a collective bargaining agreement is, is something that is going to have to be dealt with at local schools if they want to change what they're doing. Uh, you've seen some teachers unions locally enforcing collective bargaining agreements that prevent um, that prevent the school from uh, having the teachers do recorded classes. Uh, so let's say maybe the Zoom call that they had scheduled didn't work for a specific kid. They've actually used collective bargaining agreements to enforce the requirement that those um, Zoom classes not be recorded and distributed to kids. Uh, you see collective bargaining, obviously, in terms of budget cuts and, and cutting uh, budgets in ways that are protecting the most vulnerable students. Collective bargaining agreements are going to be a major barrier there on the local level as well for local district leaders. Stepping up to the state level, you think about things like uh, TECTA, which is a uh, teacher employment and dismissal uh, sort of statute that I think is, uh, you know, deal has way too many uh, state involvements in uh, local staffing decisions, uh, it, o overly onerous provisions related to um, HR decisions about hiring and firing that the state is budding, but it, uh, putting their nose into that I think if we eliminated many of those, it would create a, a much more flexibility for local leaders to do what they want. Um, fortunately, Colorado does have something in its law called the Innovation Schools Act, which allows um, any school, public, traditional, charter, um, any school to uh, receive waivers from almost every statute in, in Colorado. And I hope to see school districts and the State Board of Education approving some more of these innovation waivers, um, particularly around some of these uh, uh, employment issues that I described previously. Brenda, I know, I'm sure you have plenty of ideas as well. Yeah, and no, I think you hit on some really important ones. Uh, you know, I do think there's a, a patchwork of district level policies that could in this time be reconsidered or the districts could, local boards could at least consider doing a you know, suspension of those policies at, at, for this, at least for this time period and, and, and you know, perhaps at least to greater innovation down the road as well. But I think for specifically this remote learning environment, we're seeing some creative ideas uh, coming out of, you know, as I mentioned, some of the charter school networks where one teacher will take on um, multiple classes. So they'll have three or four classes of, let's say, um, six graders across the network, charter network. And the other, that frees up the other, and they'll provide an in, uh, live instruction via Zoom or another platform. And that frees up the other teachers to then do one-on-one -on -one chats and do some one-on-one uh, -on -one in person, not in person, but remote live instruction with students and to do kind of pull off students into small groups that way. So we're seeing those types of decisions, but then again, if you have a district level policy around sort of classroom size or how many students a teacher has, you're thinking about flexibility in those, in those, in those ways um, could be really helpful moving forward in this remote learning environment. Um, and, and then again, opening up, like even opening up sort of online schools or online um, uh, platforms to students that this has been, we've seen other states look at this as well, where, you know, online school, schools that are fully online right now might be better equipped to kind of provide this instruction to students. So what are the options available for allowing students to kind of opt into those online schools for certain courses? So perhaps they could stay enrolled at their school, but then they're taking calculus through an online, an online school instead or something. So what are those flexibilities that we need in, in our current regulatory system to allow that to happen? And then again, how do we maintain the, the kind, of, kind of accountability and ensure that those kids are still being, um, receiving high quality instruction? Perfect. Well, thank you both so much. Um, JD, can you go one more slide? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll close it here and, and we've, uh, if, if there are additional questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email. But uh, thank you all so much for joining and listening to different perspectives on, on this debate. And I do expect uh, a lot more undoubtedly to come out as, as, um, as we see more discussions around policy and uh, our listeners will have the ultimate uh, question answered about what they will be doing with their children this fall uh, answered in the coming months. So uh, I wanna alert you to an event we have next Thursday. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, the state's recently released economic and budget outlook. Uh, we'll be hearing from state uh, economists directly on that. Also be discussing some specific sectoral outlooks and uh, should be a great event. Uh, again, put in your calendar for next Thursday. But thank you all again for joining and uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you to our speakers, uh, Dr. Gunnar and, and Luke. Thank you so much. Take care.